Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 27 of CCF's Injustice at Home webinar series. Today, we are delighted to have with us Jaleel Muntakim, a former Black Panther who was released from prison last fall after being locked up for nearly 50 years, which I still can't quite wrap my head around. We're also glad to have with us Maury Salakan of the Afia Foundation and attorney Steve Downs. We're gonna be looking at the FBI's COINTELPRO program and how it was used against the Black Panther Party in many brutal and insidious ways. And then we will connect that to what's going on today with post 9-11 preemptive prosecutions of Muslims and how we can apply the lessons from the 60s and 70s to our current situation. Please put any questions you have in the chat and we will try to get to some of them at the end. So I'm gonna start with Jaleel. Jaleel Muntakim was active with the Black Panther Party in the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 1960s. And then he was imprisoned from, I think, 1971 until last October when he was released from New York State Prison on parole. He was the last former Black Panther in New York State Prison. I met him a few years ago when I represented him on a ridiculous disciplinary charge he got for teaching an approved course on Black history. And he was teaching about the history of the Black Panther Party and that got him in trouble, even though he didn't do anything wrong. We beat those charges and I later represented him on an appeal of his denial of parole. We were lucky to get a good judge and that along with Jaleel's amazing record of accomplishments while in prison resulted in his release. Jaleel has written several books, many articles and did a lot of organizing while in prison, always maintaining his involvement with the movement for black liberation. Um, Maury Salakan um, is a longtime activist and writer who has been active for decades against police abuse, wrongful incarceration, and other human rights abuses. He currently heads the Afia Foundation, which seeks the release of Afia Siddiqui, who was kidnapped and tortured at the behest of the US and is now serving a horrendous 86 year sentence in Texas prison for something she didn't do. Steve Downs is a partially retired attorney he would say retired, but I would say partially retired, who spent his career prosecuting bad judges with the Commission on Judicial Conduct. Since his official retirement in 2003, he has been um, active in a wide array of criminal justice reform efforts. He's the former executive director of CCF and is currently chair of our board. So we're gonna start with Jaleel and Jaleel, feel free to add anything else you want people to know about you since there's so much you've done and, and are continuing to do. And I understand that you've prepared a statement you'd like to read first, so let's start with that. I think you're muted. Um. Thank you, I have a problem. I have. A, I continue to do that. I haven't learned yet. <laughs> well, anyway. Everybody does that. <laughs> yeah, at any rate, first let me say assalamu alaikum, uh, peace and pause. Uh, guten Tag for those who have German uh, background. <laughs> uh, I would like to uh, first begin by setting a, 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 a foundation uh, for our discussion. I did some research this morning and I came to find some things that were very interesting that I don't think a lot of people know about, in regards, particularly in regards to the FBI and how the FBI came into existence. And so uh, this research, I think it's important uh, to share based upon our discussions. And so I'm going to read it as quickly as I possibly can, uh, and perhaps, perhaps there will be some discussions later on it. Uh, first, <clears throat> first, we must begin with the understanding that the FBI evolved out of what was, had been um, recorded as nine Secret Service agents and 25 agents from the Attorney General's office. I said at the very beginning, organized by then Attorney General Charles Bonaparte, who was the grand nephew of the French Emperor Bonaparte who at the time was frustrated for not being able to have greater control of law enforcement apparatus in the fight against the growing organized crime during that period of time. This also should be kept in mind that this developed with the support of Teddy Roosevelt, President Teddy Roosevelt, who became president after having been in the Civil, Civil Service Commission and also was uh, the head of the New York City Police Department. And he believed in law, a strong law enforcement apparatus. This developed in July 26, 2000, July 26, 1908, uh, when the FBI established under Bonaparte and the Department of Justice through 1923. By 1924, the Justice Department agent, J. Edgar Hoover, was appointed the head of the growing FBI. 
Prior to his rise to that position, it's important to note that Hoover was one of the lead agents that targeted Marcus Garvey in 1919, and the United Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, recognized as the largest Black organization in history. However, in his ilk, he, however, Hoover and his ilk, not being able to discover any wrongdoing by Garvey, uh, charged, uh, uh, used other methods, FBI contri contrived methods, uh, infiltrated and uh, 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 infiltrated the Garvey organization and eventually uh, came up with the charges of fraud. After spending time in prison, Garvey in 1927 was deported and exiled from the US. Um, keep in mind that the international stage at that during that period of time uh, in the international stage in 1917, the Bolshevik revolution was succeeding and in, and in the United States, the FBI was engaged in the so-called Red Scare. Uh, so we have to put this in context, both the international and the national. Uh, the Palmer raids under the agency of the Department of Justice during the administration of Woodrow Wilson from November 1919 to January of 1920 rounded up radicals, anarchists, and sympathizers of the Re revolution, the Russian Revolution. Hence, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, white supremacist ideology and being power struck made the FBI the most feared law enforcement agency in the country. Uh, this was established, this was accomplished by every dirty trick in the books. In the 1920s through the 1940s, the FBI targeted anarchists, socialists, and communists, arresting, rounding up, detaining, and deporting during that period. This included an internment, the filling up in concentration camps of Japanese, supporting the House Un-American Acti Activities Committee during the McCarthy era, and state prosecution of socialists and those alleged to be communists and communist sympathizers. By 1956, Hoover and the FBI was well honed in the techniques of surveillance and, and disruption when the, name, when the name brand of such practices took on the acronym COINTELPRO. By 1967, the FBI initiated its COINTELPRO, uh, hate, uh, COINTELPRO Black Hate Program, directing 300 of its 365 acts of state terrorism on Black and civil rights, Black civil rights and Black power leaders and movements. In March 1971, uh, the accidental discovery and exposure to the FBI counterintelligence program by anti Vietnam War activists calling themselves Citizens Commission in Meade, Pennsylvania, ultimately revealed to the world how murderous the FBI had grown to become under the maniacal leadership of J. Edgar Hoover. COINTELPRO essentially applied five main methods to disrupt and destroy progressive and revolutionary determinations as indicated in Brian Glick's book, War at Home. One, infiltration, right? Infiltrating the organizations and building a means by which they can essentially co-opt the programs of those organizations. Uh, psychological warfare, uh, creating what we call uh, uh, dirty pen letters uh, uh, and, and creating a, a dissension within the organization uh, between the, the leaderships and uh, the membership or between other organizations, harassing the legal uh, system, right? Uh, stop and search uh, activities, uh, arresting people uh, for first like Black Panther Party, arresting them for selling the newspaper as an example. Uh, illegal force, right? Break-ins and uh, uh, planting, uh, uh, planting uh, uh, illegal activities on, or planting like weapons and stuff like that on on people, drugs on people, uh, and undermining public opinion, uh, creating conditions for which the the organization, progressive organization, would be not respected or not be uh, supported by the general population. Uh, by the summer. Uh, between 1972 and 74, the FBI planted over 500 eavesdropping bugs without warrants, uh, opened 200 personal letters, 2,000 personal letters, and is responsible directly or indirectly for the death of scores of Black, Native Americans, and Euro-American activists. Today, their lingers in prison captured civilians under the court jail conviction, conviction, many spending over 30 years in prison. So <clears throat> efforts have been been made or efforts have been tried to have these people release uh, or reopen court temporal hearings. In 2020, 2001, efforts to reopen court temporal hearings was by former uh, Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, who was harassed by the FBI for attempting to do so. It is with this understanding of the history of the surveillance government and the institutionalization of white supremacy, we commenced this talk, hoping to share ideas and lessons learned as we continue to build movements that serve the interests of our common humanity and not the greed of the 600 billionaires or 2,800 families who controls and owns 90% of the wealth of this country. 
And so with that, I, I just want to open that up on those points. I'll give some basic history. I know I talk fast. I'm trying to get that information out there. Uh, but it's important to know that the FBI has been engaged in these kind of activities from its onset. Uh, we understand the, the historical dynamics of which it evolved uh, from, uh, 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 particularly in, in 1900s, early 1900s, uh, what was going on in Russia and the Russian Revolution was going on at that time, and how uh, that influenced uh, um, um, uh, the FBI's uh, worldview uh, in terms of trying to uh, keep America safe uh, from the Red Scare uh, and what all that entailed in that process. Uh, leading to, uh, uh, in some instances, uh, uh, leading to uh, people being murdered, like the Rosenthal uh, and, and, and many others. And so if we don't understand that history, that dynamic, then we will not have a really foundation to understand what we, how we're moving forward uh, today under this quote unquote surveillance uh, government. Thanks, Jaleel. That, that was a great historical background. Some of that I didn't know. I didn't know anything about the FBI before Hoover. I didn't know that Hoover actually targeted Marcus Garvey. I didn't know that some of, some of a lot of the other things you said either. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, Jaleel, can you talk a bit about what it was like to work with the Black Panther Party back there in the late 60s in the Bay Area and what kind of things you did, what was going on? Certainly. Um, my relationship with Black Panther Party started when I was age 16. Uh, at that time, I had some friends of mine, schools, uh, old school friends of mine, elementary school friends of mine who had since joined. Uh, I was raised in a family whereby we were taught from the very beginning uh, at an early age that we are African. Uh, my mom was a, a student of African dance at the time. And uh, so she used to teach my, 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 my sister and I uh, how to African dance. And she did not go for the the idea of being named a Negro or colored person or anything of that nature. She said we was of African descent. And so that kind of consciousness, I was raised with that kind of consciousness. Uh, growing up and then during the, the Jim Crow era, I knew that it was a social divide and there was a problem with that. Um, I had an example, I had, had an experience uh, riding a school bus. Um, um, and uh, at that time, because of Jim Crow, you had to ride school bus, yet black people had to ride at the back of the bus. And so that one day I wanted to sit in the front of the bus and the bus driver told me, no, get me back in the bus. And uh, a white woman stood up and said, listen, he can sit up here in front with me. And I did. Uh, she got to her bus stop and she left and the and bus driver told me, go to the back of the bus. He used some, you know, not nice words, but he said, go to the back of the bus. And <clears throat> I looked around and said, there was another white person who come stand uh, uh, in, in my behalf to uh, allow me to sit up front, none did. I went to the back of the bus. And that was a, a, a impactful to understanding how, for the most part, uh, laws are created and people adhere to the laws, and their behavior adjusts to the laws. And for reasons that, uh, um, that for oftentimes they truly don't understand what kind of impact that has on other people's lives, uh, like, like uh, the black codes, uh, uh, Jim Crow laws, uh, and uh, um, what we're finding out today, I mean, the surveillance laws. At any rate, uh, moving forward uh, from high school, I became a member of the uh, organizer of the Black Student Union. And uh, that led to me uh, uh, moving towards the ideals that there need to be something more to happen uh, in regards to our civil rights uh, struggle, uh, uh, particularly after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I began to look towards Black Panther Party uh, for that kind of leadership. Uh, my mom had been a member of the NAACP. And as a young kid, she used to take us out on marches and stuff like that, right? And so I had that kind of fervor understanding that we have to engage in uh, some degree of struggle, uh, some degree of fight back. Uh, and because of the generation divide, as you often find even today, between uh, the young people and the older people, uh, we began to look at the civil rights movement that's being passe, right? The young people are looking at the Black Panther Party as being the new wave of a uh, struggle. And so uh, ultimately, I joined, I signed up when I was 16 and began to uh, engage with them with uh, uh, the newspapers, uh, uh, the uh, free breakfast program and the health, uh, health clinic. I used to go into the health clinic and assist in the areas that I could uh, in, that, in those particular areas. Uh, and also at some point in time, I was recruited into uh, what was called the Black Underground. And uh, then began to do work in security, areas of security. Uh, and so that was kind of, Working with them. And it's important to understand that 
uh, parties through the Black Panther Party and the Black Underground. Um, the Black Panther Party original name was Black Panther Party for Self Defense. Okay, and a lot of people forget that, right? That the, the origins was one of for self defense, a uh, self defense of the Black community, and within the Black Panther Party, from its origins, from its inception, there was the idea that will eventually become a uh, um, a Black Underground. And so, rule number six for the Black Panther Party was that no Black Panther Party member can join any other organization, underground organization, but the Black Liberation Army. So the Black Liberation Army, the idea of Black Liberation Army was already structured inside the, uh, the, the formation of the Black Panther Party as a uh, uh, part and parcel of what would be evolving in the course of the struggle uh, that was being led by the Black Panther Party. Okay. Um... Were you aware at the time that the FBI was going after the Black Panther Party? Like, what did you know about that at the time? Hmm. That's a very good question. I've been asked that several times. And the only way I can answer that is this. <clears throat> well, the best way I can answer that is this. The Black Panther Party uh, was a youth movement, right? Uh, at the inception of Black Panther, the beginning of the Black Panther Party was no one older than 30 years old. old. And because it was a youth movement, many of our understanding guards of what we engaged in was based upon an infantile understanding of the, 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 uh, uh, the our opposition, right? And that's, and that's the, the government. And so for us, uh, going in understanding of the struggle, uh, going in terms of what we are engaged in, we had no idea to what extent that the government would use uh, its resources uh, to destroy the party. Um, and we have since learned, of course, uh, that the government used every every form, uh, uh, means and method by which they destabilize the country, they destabilize the Black Panther Party. Every means and method which they use to, de to destabilize a country, they use to destabilize the Black Panther Party. So in, off the top of the head, right, um, in understanding of where we were at, 16, 17 year olds, uh, 25, 23 year old kids, right, young people engaged in this struggle, we had no clue for the most part, to what extent the government would oppose us and would fight against us. And the idea that the FBI would use those kind of tactics, tactics to destroy the country, uh, to destroy the Black Panther Party, we didn't have a clue. Yeah, it's a really good point you make about that they use the same tactics that they use against countries. So it's kind of like the CIA was doing the same exact things in the international context that the FBI was doing at home. Um, yeah. What would you say um, is the overall effect that this COINTELPRO, these COINTELPRO tactics had on the Black Panther Party? The overall impact, it destroyed the party. <laughs> I mean, obviously. Yeah, you know, the it, impact, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah it, it destroyed the party. Uh, it created dissension um, in its ranks uh, that, that ultimately led to a split in the party. Uh, it, it, it created conditions by which uh, some members uh, were, were murdered and killed. Uh, for, for example, uh, Bunchy Carter and, and John Huggins down in, uh, in LA, uh, UCLA, uh, the, the strife between the US organization and the Black Panther Party. That was instigated by the FBI. Uh, the murders of, uh, 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 of Fred Hampton in Chicago, 21 years old, brilliant young man, right, was murdered by the FBI uh, as the instigation and involvement of the FBI and the Chicago Police Department. Uh, and, and so we, there, there's a number of uh, cases, a number of uh, incidents uh, that was caused by, by virtue, either directly or indirectly, uh, by the FBI, uh, the death of uh, political prisoners, uh, death, excuse me, death of uh, uh, Panthers, uh, and uh, uh, the murder of uh, other organizations such as AIM, uh, Native, uh, Native American organization, uh, who were lost lives as a result of COINTELPRO uh, uh, in, engagement. Uh, so uh, the the part of the FBI and the FBI uh, operations essentially um, uh, destabilized the party, uh, created uh, internecine uh, warfare within the party, and uh, prohibited the party from being being engaging in the type of uh, programs that it originally started with the, the uh, uh, um, uh, survival programs, been the revolution, where they are actually a social movement. Uh, working in the interests of, of the community at large, uh, serving the interests of the community at large, uh, and they prohibited that from happening. That's one of the principles uh, of uh, FBI COINTELPRO program. 
uh, was to uh, was to prevent. Uh, number four, to prevent the militant nationalist groups and leaders from gaining respectability uh, by discrediting and uh, uh, discrediting the, uh, 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 them amongst the the community. Uh, the goal of the, of of three ways must be discredit these groups and individuals the first and foremost amongst the quote unquote Negro community, and they must be discredited amongst the white community. And so that's one of the tactics that was used uh, uh, to discredit the, um, the the party. And so therefore, we did not have the kind of support uh, that was originally uh, uh, organized, originally put together uh, 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 by the party's activities in the community. You know, uh, another instance, which is goes all the way back from when uh, um, uh, <clears throat> Hoover uh, interacted with with, uh, um, with Marcus Garvey, uh, the point of uh, the Cointelpo was to, to prevent the rise of a messiah, right? <laughs> you know, this goes back all the way back from 1919, and this this document was in 1968 uh, when it was put together, and it shows the, the mentality of, of Hoover uh, during that period of time from experience of dealing with uh, Marcus Garvey that he felt that it was the need to prevent the rise of of a messiah who could unify, electrify the military black nationalist movement, right? He saw Malcolm X could have possibly been that person. That's based on the experience that he had with Marcus Garvey and the 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 the, the, the profound organizing that Garvey was able to accomplish, the, the largest black organization that ever existed in, in, in here in the United States or in the world, uh, uh, based upon UNIA and the expansion in Africa, Latin America, uh, uh, um, and, and, and in, Africa, uh, in Africa, in the Caribbean. You know, uh, so they, they want to prevent that from ever happening again. And so they're going to use every tactic, and they have used every tactic they possibly can to prevent that from happening again. Yes, and I think um, even though COINTELPRO was um, aimed at other groups too, besides the Black Panthers, I think that was probably its number one target, partly for those reasons you just said, because they're, they're Black and they were um so afraid of black people rising up but also because it was marxist leninist right and that hoover was super anti-communist that was so the combination of those two things too um i want to just ask you about when when i met you in prison you told me a story about how the circumstances of when you converted to islam would you like to share that with us i think it's pretty interesting <laughs> okay <laughs> all right um yeah uh, I was, what, 21, uh, 21 years of age, and um, I, I <clears throat> was transferred from uh, San Quentin prison to a, a jail in, uh, in New York. And uh, in that jail, I ran into two icons of the movement, a brother by the name of Max Sanford uh, and another brother by the name of H. Rap Brown. Max Sanford was the leader of a group called the Revolutionary Action Movement, RAM. And... Uh, uh, and Rap Brown was known for his leadership in both the uh, SNCC, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, as well as uh, uh, the Black Panther Party. I think Black Panther Party, he was once known as, uh, was a uh, 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 minister of justice in the Black Panther Party. <clears throat> um, and so at that time, I considered myself a Black communist, right? Uh, I didn't have any real um, feelings that religion was going to free us, right? Based upon the, the the, the practice and theology of Christianity. I had to turn the other cheek and what I've seen, uh, so you get slapped on the other side of the cheek and forgive your enemy and all that uh, was not resonating with me. Uh, and certainly was not resonating with me based upon uh, the civil rights movement who was being led for the most part by SCLC, uh, which is a uh, 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 Southern Christian Leadership uh, co Conference, uh, mostly uh, preachers. And, and reverence. And uh, so uh, when I was transferred to uh, New York and I saw these two iconic leaders um, getting up five times a day and saying their prayers, I had a question there. I said, what the heck are you guys doing? <laughs> you know? And uh, Muhammad uh, Ahmed, who was originally named Max Stanford, his name is changed to Muhammad Ahmed, and uh, Rap Brown uh, changed his name to Jamil Alameen. Uh, Rap Brown is still in prison, and we're doing everything we possibly can uh, to have him released uh, uh, for the bogus charges that, that he's been, been convicted of. Uh, and so I was in a discussion with him for about six months, 
you know, trying to understand this dynamic of uh, uh, their belief in this religion. And uh, at one point in time, you know, I took what I call a Faustian compromise. Uh, you'd be damned if you do, you'd be damned if you don't, right? And then uh, uh, um, uh, Jamil, Imam Jamil came with the proposition to me. He said, listen, um, you're a good person, right? And I said, yeah, man, I'm a good person. He said, I'm gonna do the right thing. You know, my heart is in the right place and so forth and so on. So then if you become Muslim, then you don't lose nothing, right? If there's no, no afterlife, Right? then you don't lose nothing, right? But now, being a good person, it doesn't change you, who you are. And if there is afterlife, and you don't become Muslim, you might lose everything, right? <laughs> so I hit my bets right there, <laughs> and I hit my bets. I said, okay, <laughs> I think you got me there, right? And the other, the other thing too, because I'm a scientist, right, social scientist, and I understand physics. And knowing physics, there's uh, uh, one issue that we cannot resolve, you know, in terms of our understanding science, and that's the question, of energy, what happens to energy? Why does it leave this, this incarnation, right? Does it just dissipate into the ethers or do we take consciousness with it? And so again, you know, that kind of thing has not been resolved. And if we believe that this energy never dies, energy never dies, it just transmute, it transforms, right? Then what is gonna be the transformation uh, from this incarnation to the next, or if there is a next, uh, next incarnation? And so in that instance, there is a science behind the idea that there may be more to this life as, it, as, as <clears throat> to what now exists, right? Very similarly to an um, argument made that a baby in the womb, right, in that world, right, doesn't know the next world, the trans transforming uh, in, into the next world based upon this birth. So is it possible that this world can be a womb for the next world, our 80, 70 years that we have on this incarnation? Uh, um, like the nine months that that child would have in, in that womb. And so taking all these things into consideration, right, I, I thought, well, hey, you know, uh, let me hedge my bets on this thing. And the other thing was, what was important to me was the fact that uh, I said, listen, uh, I, I asked the imam, I said, listen, we're not going to be like the, the Christians have to take a slap in the face on one side and take a slap in the face on the other side too. And, and all that, he said, no, said, that's not in the Quran. But God says, fight turmoil and oppression, and oppression wherever you may find it. That turmoil and oppression is worse than slaughter, right? And that resonated with me, right? Because we continue to be engaged, I have to be engaged in, in the fight against turmoil and oppression. Uh, the oppression of the those of the super rich uh, who continue to exploit the planet, not just individuals, but exploit the planet, right? And we have an obligation uh, uh, to, uh, to, to inhibit uh, them, to prohibit them from this kind of um, oppression uh, and tumult that they have created on this planet. And so the, for me, that legitimizes uh, my spirit in regards to the issues of uh, uh, engaging and continue to fight uh, for what in my heart and for many of us know is the right thing to do. All right, thank you, Jalil. Um, I'd like to turn now to Maury. Maury's here with us. Maury, can you share your reaction to hearing Jaleel talk about becoming converted to Islam through his conversations with Imam Jalil Alamin and um, talk maybe just a little bit about Imam Jalil Alamin, the former Ajrup Brown, without getting into too much, and, and maybe how his case might be kind of a bridge between the attacks on the Black Power movement of the 60s and the attacks on it, it, Muslims it, today as part of the war on terror. Yes, it, it tickled me when I heard, <laughs> when I heard Brother uh, uh, Jalil uh, referencing some of the logic of Imam Jamil. You know, he's known for that spiritual logic, and it, it really tickled me to uh, he, uh, hear him relate some of that. You know, as I was listening to Brother uh, Jalil Muntakim, and I want to salute him for being. Uh, one of the survivors, one of the survivors of one of the most one of the most turbulent decades in American history. And it's interesting. I always I always look at the parallel, you know, in terms of time. You know, the 1960s was exactly it was a hundred years, one century, you know, after the 1860s, when 
you know, America experienced another very turbulent decade, the civil, the civil war that ultimately led to the civil war and everything that followed that. Um, I remember one time bringing Imam Jamil to the airport. I, I had the, uh, uh, the pleasure of, um, first of all, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, all praises due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Uh, I had the opportunity of, of uh, taking Imam Jamil to the airport after one of his speaking engagements in the Washington area. And during the ride to the airport, I, I asked him, you know, to, I asked him, what was the 1960s like? You know, what was that whole period like? You know, I was a young boy in the 60s. I mean, so I can remember some things, but, you know, um, there, you know, he was Imam Jamil as H. Rab Brown was right in the heart, right in the thick of things as a young man in his, in his early 20s. I asked him, what was that like, the, that, that whole struggle? He said it was a war. I'll never forget his words. He said it was a war. And that is precisely what it, it was. It was, a, it was a war. It was a second civil war in the United States. And um, I, I'm reminded of something that, you know, Franz Fanon, uh, that, that, you know, uh, brilliant, uh, psychologists and, and one of the uh, interpreters of the one of the blood, bloodiest revolutions to take place during the 20th century, the Algerian revolution, what he said in his book, um, Wretched of the Earth, he said, each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. Uh, this, this is the challenge before us. This is the challenge that has been with us and every other generation in every part of the world, you know, um, uh, in, in, in every generation of our human lives, this challenge, you know, to um, be agents for positive change. Uh, and alhamdulillah, again, I, wanna, I want to uh, commend Brother Jalil for, you know, he, he was a political prisoner for subhanAllah for you know, uh, almost a half century and, and, you know, going into prison at a very young age and, and, and surviving that by the grace and mercy of Allah and coming out and not hiding in a hole, but, you know, you know, sharing his experiences, sharing his insights uh, gleaned. And uh, so alhamdulillah, may Allah ta'ala continue to bless and fortify this brother. And I also want to salute uh, the Coalition for Civil Freedoms for being you know, one of the courageous organizations on the block, not afraid to deal with these issues, these issues that have to be dealt with if we are to help this country live up to the better part of itself. Imam Jamil Alameen is a bridge. He is a bridge between two generations uh, in, in terms of um, uh, uh, the, the sociology of struggle in America. He's a, he's, he represents two generations of, of, of political prisoners. You know, the political prisoners that came out of that turbulent decade of the 1960s. Uh, he, again, was one of the most prominent figures as H. Rap Brown during that period. Uh, you can't pick up a documentary on the 1960s without at some point in that documentary seeing footage of H. Rap Brown, of, of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, of other uh, persons within it, Kwame Toure, who was then known as Stokely Carmichael, and you know the the, the Black Panthers, who uh, my understanding, I was a young Black Panther. I was, uh, you know, I, I I became a Black Panther in Connecticut uh, as a teenager, as it was beginning to its, its decline, and. You know, uh, one of the reasons why I ended up leaving the Black Panther Party and then going into the nation uh, was um, because I began to see things that were troubling for me, that things that represented contradictions. I wouldn't learn until many, many years later after I studied the period and I understood the history and I was able to connect the dots that what I saw then that I didn't understand, I was too young to understand, was the effects of COINTELPRO. That's what I saw. And um, but anyway, so I spent about six months in the 
uh, New Haven, Connecticut chapter of the Black Panther Party went from there into the nation, Temple Number 42 in Bridge, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, after a few years, you know, making the transition under the late Imam Muhammad Muhammad into the the full, you know, um, uh, uh, bloom of of Islam as Islam is practiced around the world, but with a very unique uh, flavor to it, and that is a flavor that uh, uh, comes through my being an African American Muslim, having had this African American experience. You know, we have a very unique um, way of viewing our Islam, expressing our Islam with a heavy emphasis on justice, a heavy emphasis on what Allah says in the Quran to stand firmly for justice as witnesses, even if it be against yourselves, That's your true. parents or your kin, or whether it be against rich or poor, for Allah can best protect both. And then we are instructed in that verse, do not follow the lusts of your hearts, lest you swerve. And if you distort justice or decline to do justice, know that Allah is ever mindful of what you, what do. you do. That is followed by that verse in the Quran by what the prophet said, peace be upon him. He said, when you see an evil action, you must change it with your hand. If you cannot do so with your tongue, if you cannot do so, detest it within your heart. And that is the weakest degree of faith. And then there's another hadith that you, we, we don't hear that often, but it is so relevant and especially relevant to this time we're in now where the, 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 the entire globe is in the throes of a pandemic. The prophet said, by the one in whose hand rests my soul, you must surely enjoy the good. He was talking to his companions, but not just to that generation of companions that were with him all the way to the end of time. He said, you must, uh, 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 he said, you must uh, enjoy the good and forbid the evil. Otherwise, it is expected that Allah will send against you a punishment. And you will supplicate him, but your supplications will not be answered. You know, that hadith of the prophet has special resonance for me now when we see the, the global community in the throes of a pandemic. And Allah says in the Quran, no calamity occurs except by the permission of Allah. This is a punishing wake up call for the world. And it's an opportunity for us to engage in a reset. And so it, it, it's, it's important for us to have these kinds of dialogues. It's important for us uh, to remember our political prisoners, to fight for our political prisoners, Muslim and non-Muslim, um, and to understand the connections that are essential, absolutely essential to be made uh, between this struggle that we are faced with right now and, and the words of Thomas Jefferson, one of the <laughs> one, one of the founding fathers who was a contradiction, you know, in himself. I mean, he held slaves while writing those esteemed words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And women were excluded and, 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 and those black skinned individuals that he held and others held uh, were, were excluded. But he wrote those, press, uh, those, 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 those inspiring words. You can see them on you know, the, uh, the, the, the walls of his monument, but there's another quote on the walls of his monument that you can see that, that reflects his understanding that there was a consequence for these contradictions. He said, I tremble for my country. When I reflect God is just, his justice cannot sleep forever. And what Jefferson was actually doing, he was echoing what, what uh, Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, one of the great uh, 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 Muslim theologians, many generations before Jefferson said, he says, civilization is based on justice and the consequences of oppression are devastating. Therefore, it is said, Allah aids the just state, even if it is non-Muslim and withholds his help from the oppressive state, even if it is Muslim. So, you know, we are reminded of these things. This uh, webinar today is a reminder to us all that we have to continue to engage uh, in the work of reforming this nation, making it, helping to make it live up to the better part of itself, freeing its political prisoners, uh, because if we don't engage in this work, 
If we think we're experiencing some tough times now, it's nothing compared to what's on the horizon. And, and as, I, what was it, who, who was it that said? Was it George Santanyana uh, said those immortal words, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. You know, this, this, this is a serious issue. This is a very, very serious issue. And, 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 and so, you know, we, we should take it all to heart. I want to, again, I want to salute CCF for, for holding this webinar today on this issue. It, it's, it's, it's really some, some good spiritual food for the Muslims who are about to engage in a month of internal jihad, in the month of Ramadan. Wow. Thank you, Maury. Excellent points as always. And um, I feel like it would do of you just having a conversation for a whole webinar. Sometimes just going through that history and all this, it's it's fascinating to me. And I didn't even know you were in the Black Panther Party in New Haven. I've known you for a long time. But there's a lot that I don't know. I'm sure it's fascinating. I was a, a teeny weeny you know. Black Panther for six months. <laughs> Well, like Lil said, it was a youth movement, right? Yeah, um, let me just turn to Steve, okay? Because we, I wanted to just get Steve in here for a couple of minutes. Um, Steve, can you add to what we've heard about COINTELPRO and, and talk about what happened after it was uncovered by that group of peace activists in Pennsylvania? And you got to unmute. Say so he did it too. Unmute. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Okay. Uh, as as <laughs> um, it's quite a story how the uh, the COINTELPRO, um, I, I like to call it a conspiracy, really, uh, was broken up uh, by the FBI uh, that had created it. And it was done by a group of typical average citizens that get, got together and said, we've had enough. We're going to get rid of this. Uh, these were uh, Vietnam War protesters. They were tired of having their groups infiltrated by the FBI and having their uh, charges brought against them and harassment and um, just the usual stuff. And they, they realized that there was this heavy weight of the government following them around, pushing them down. And they said, uh, there's, we're just, there's no way, no one's listening to us. We're never going to get to the bottom of this. What we have to do is we'll burglarize an FBI office, steal all their files, give it to the journalists and let them uh, see for themselves. And that's exactly what they did. It was a brilliant uh, operation by people that would be the least likely burglars you can imagine. Um, they pulled it off. It was secret. Uh, they were never caught. And eventually, uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the burglary. Uh, they've been coming out more. And there's a film out now about it, I think. And I, I really recommend everybody should see it. Because in the end, that may be the best defense we have there's, it's really hard to find a better way to uh, prohibit and, and block this kind of abuse of power than by cit citizens taking responsibility for it, not in my name. Um, so after the uh, church committee had its um, uh, hearings in 1974, uh, it was exposed- yes, in What? In, in Congress, right? Yeah, with Congress. Uh, they, uh, they exposed what was going on. And clearly, all of this program was driven by fear and racism. And once it was the, the light was shown on it, Congress reacted at least minimally to it by saying, all right, this is not acceptable. This is the FBI making war on its own people. And that's not appropriate for government. We're going to scale this back. You've got to go back. So they introduced some measures. It was kind of like a tool that the FBI had. And they said, that tool is being used inappropriately. Put it back in your holster. And they did. They scaled it back a bit. They didn't actually not use it. There are a lot of the things that happened in the years since, but they were not using it as much. But the problem was that all of this was based on fear and racism. And the minute that the country came under the next attack, the next incident that would generate this fear and attack, the tool came right out of the holster again. And that, that event was 
and the attack on, on the World Trade Center in, in uh, Washington. And so almost immediately, all of these restrictions that had been internalized in the FBI came off and they began to go after them again with a, uh, with a, this time focusing primarily on the Muslim community with surveillance and with false charges and uh, locking people up and, and trying to essentially do a reign of terror in the, Mer the Muslim community to keep them repressed, uh, to keep them uh, avoid getting involved in what was going to be a big war involving Muslim countries abroad. Um, and for example, uh, one of the big things in COINTELPRO were the uh, false charges against people like Geronimo Pratt, and who was, uh, was charged with murder. I spent 25 years in jail and the whole time the FBI knew that he, because they had wiretaps out there, they could see that he was 400 miles away. Oh, sorry, 27 years, I guess 27 years in jail, I'm getting an old note here. Um, they could see he was 400 miles away, but they never revealed that. And it only came out after, after a very long period of time. So here the FBI is starting to do that same thing again, bringing false charges against Muslims uh, and particularly with entrapments uh, to uh, claim that they were terrorists when in fact they were not. What, I got involved in this uh, through a, uh, a case involving my, my friend Yassin Araf, who was charged with material support for terrorism. Uh, the FBI set up this big, uh, horrible terrorist incident to, uh, and then tried to involve him in it, but in fact, never did involve him, never told him anything about it, so that he had no way of knowing that there was this supposed terrorist incident out there. And uh, after he was convicted, I remember the uh, prosecutor talking about it at a news conference. And one of the newspaper reporters said, you know, we didn't see any evidence that Yassin was involved in this terrorist scheme that you'd cooked up. Uh, do you have any evidence that he was a terrorist? And the prosecutor was sort of surprised and said, no, we didn't have any evidence that he was a terrorist, but he had the ideology. In order to preempt anything from happening, we decided to do this thing and entrap him. And that phrase, you know, we didn't have any evidence that he was a terrorist, but he had the ideology, we wanted to preempt him, created this phrase that we've often applied to this, the new wave of COINTELPRO, uh, preemptive prosecution, prosecuting innocent people before they commit a crime to preempt them from happening, something happening. So um, I, that, my, my sense of that is that um, all of this is generated by racism and fear, and it will continue uh, until normal citizens like you and I stand up there and do something about it and, and protest it. There are institutions that should have stopped this, the courts, for example. They have failed miserably. They have not dealt with, dealt with this. Uh, in the Korematsu case involving the Japanese, uh, Supreme Court there held, well, you know, what, what FDR is doing is it's not, it's not proper, it's not constitutional, but there's a uh, classified report that talks about how uh, the, um, the security issues for the Japanese on the West Coast. We cannot go back and second guess the, uh, the, well, how the executive runs a war. So we're going to defer to the executive and that we're going to uphold this order. And so that deference in a national security situation, particularly where there's classified information, has basically kind of pushed the courts out of it. Uh, they have not been the defenders of the, the liberty that we, I would have hoped for and expected in this particular case. Um, I think for the most part, a lot of the journalists have failed to do it. I mean, we, have, we know very many good journalists who have raised a lot of really good questions, but that it has not um, mobilize people in the way that I would have hoped that they, they would have. So once again, it keeps coming back to citizens, citizens who are willing to take up the cudgel and say, uh, we're not going to stand for this anymore. We're not going to stand to see our brothers, black, whatever, uh, treated in this way. We are all Americans together and we all ought to be treated equally. All right. Thanks, um, I'd like to turn back to Jaleel. I hope I'm, uh, my sound is not messing up too much, but Jaleel, yes. uh, what would you say are the main lessons 
lessons we should take from the COINTEL, from COINTELPRO back in the <clears throat> 60s and 70s and how can we learn from that to try to fight the current attacks on Muslims and, and others that are going on today? And, and what could we do to prevent this from happening in the future, like Steve was talking about? Yeah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Uh, first of all, uh, one of the things we need to do is uh, continue to fight for the release of those individuals who are still in prison who have COINTELPRO convictions, yes. all right? That's number one, right? Uh, we need to fight for their release. Uh, we fight, fight for the release of Imam Jamil al uh, for Sunni Adel Koli, for Mutulu Shakur, for, for Maroon, uh, for uh, um, a host of others who are in prison as a result of uh, Kamau, uh, in, uh, in prison for as a result of uh, <clears throat> these Quarantel Pro uh, convictions, uh, Point Dexter down in Nebraska. Uh, we just lost one of my comrades, uh, Fritz, uh, Fitzgerald, Chip Fitzgerald, who just passed away from a massive heart attack in California. Uh, he had been in prison almost 50, 51 years. Uh, as, as a result of Cointel Pro instigations of, of Black Panther Party. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> it is extremely important uh, that we move towards the idea that this has to change by virtue of demanding the release of Cointel Pro victims. So if we can do just do that alone, uh, that will set a stage by which we can have a broader dialogue, broader conversation as to the issues of surveillance, of surveillance government, right? And how the surveillance government actually put people in prison and or killed them as a result of the, the, the protecting of the super rich, uh, the, co the, the corporate government itself. Uh, <clears throat> and so that, that, that's the issue. Uh, second of all, in terms of organizing, uh, we must be exact in terms of our relationships with one another. Uh, there are principles of which we can organize and develop, develop relationships of trust and, and, and honor uh, so that we not be victimized uh, by virtues of infiltration and provocateurism, right? Uh, so we have to be very careful in regards to our own relationship with one another in, in that respect. And if we can learn those lessons, make it very, very difficult uh, for the government to, <clears throat> to infiltrate a movement and or use a provocateur, uh, of, of provocative actions uh, to create dissension and division, knowing that the government will always operate on the, basis, on the basis of divide and conquer. All right. And so our best uh, uh, weapons against divide and conquer is unity and uniformity. Right? And when we can build on the basis of that uni unity and uniformity, spiritually, spiritually as well as uh, ideologically, uh, <clears throat> we can ensure that our goals and objectives will be achieved. Thirdly, being God consciousness, right? we always got to put God first. You right? got to always put the law first. We put our trust in the law. The man plans and the law plans and, and the law is the best of planners. Right? And so on the essence of that alone, our goal and objective is to continue to move forward with the idea that we will achieve if we if if we are in fact in in, in the work itself, all right, uh, by relying upon uh, our own God consciousness, right? Uh, uh, that uh, a lot was going to allow us to, to be successful uh, by doing the good work, all right. And, and so faith is, is very important uh, 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 to overcome the obstacles of, of our of our enemy, our, our opposition. Uh, if you don't have the faith. There ain't no need you being engaged in this in the struggle in the first place. All right? If you don't believe that you can win, it don't be involved, engaged in the struggle in the first place. All right? Can you come in the struggle from a defeatist point of view uh, from Jump Street? And so <clears throat> that's the, uh, one of the ideas that we have to inculcate in, in, in regards to our, our, our goals and objectives to, that we can, in fact, win. Right? Uh, uh, one of my comrades, uh, Asada Shakur, said that, <clears throat> that uh, we have a duty to engage in the struggle, to engage in the fight, and we have a duty to win. Right? And so that is one of the things that uh, we, we must uh, uh, be strong in, in our, in our beliefs, right? Uh, that we, in fact, we, we can win. Um, it's going to be a hard road moving forward. You know, it's not going to be easy. Uh, and it's going to be from generation to generation. I, I, like I tell young people today, uh, uh, this, is, this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And, and as a uh, uh, brother, uh, Maureen had, had made mention of the quote from uh, 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 France Fanon, or the France Fanon, uh, uh, that every generation uh, must find its place and move forward, right? Then it's our obligation to make sure that this generation makes it easier for the generation that comes behind us. And this is one of the reasons why we have to be engaging. Uh, uh, my, my thoughts as, as I was growing up was that we're going to win the revolution within my lifetime. I don't believe that anymore, right? But I know that every part that I make today is gonna make it easier for my grandkids, and my great grandkids, 
Uh, so that, that's what we have to, have to begin to look uh, towards. <clears throat> um, but more importantly, uh, we also have to build international, uh, international support and solidarity. Uh, I'm the founder of Jericho Movement. And October, in October of this year, uh, we'll be engaging, uh, we will have what we uh, call the International Tribunal 2021. Where we're calling for the international uh, jurists to come to the United States and discuss the issues not only political prisoners, but the issues of genocide uh, as it has been confronting uh, black people and people of color, Native Americans, uh, and, and brown people in this country, uh, Latinx in this country. And so on October 22nd to the 24th, I believe it's gonna be, and we're gonna have the international jurists at Columbia University, uh, the International Tribunal 2021 where we charge genocides. We are taking the 70th anniversary of uh, Paul Robeson and William Patterson when they brought to the United States, the first time bringing to the United States the charge of genocides uh, back in 1951. And so this is the 70th anniversary of that. We are commemorating that idea and we are building international support base uh, uh, to ensure that the people around the world understand what we are engaged in here and within the domestic uh, 3,000 by 2,000 territory of the United States. And so that's how we're moving forward uh, in building a, a campaign. It has to be a mass movement in order for us to survive, right? Small organizations, uh, uh, um, Working on their own silos uh, is not going to make it work. One of the things that Cointelpo did or uh, uh, argued for, uh, argued uh, 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 against is that <clears throat> one, to prevent the coalition of black militant nationalist groups in unity, there is strength. That's a truism, right? And that is no less valid for all of its triteness. An effective coalition of black nationalist groups might be the first step towards a real mile mile in America, beginning of a true black revolution. So that's where I made the argument about uh, unity and uniformity, right? Because they're always going to try to prevent us from gaining and building coalition or coalition building, whether it be on a national level or on an international level. So we always have to move for the idea, the idea and imagination that we can win, right? And that we can build this kind of national, international uh, solidarity amongst our group, various groups and organizations. Fred Hampton, uh, who was murdered at the age of 21, was the first one to put forth the idea of what? A rainbow coalition, right? It was appropriated by Jesse Jackson. But it was a Fred Hampton on the Black Panther Party who came up with this idea of a rainbow coalition. That idea still, still should resonate today, okay? Uh, and moving forward, uh, both on the national and international level. And so those are ways where we can defeat these kind of uh, practices of COINTELPRO uh, and, and the actions of the opposition, right? Uh, uh, state, state surveillance and state uh, 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 terrorism uh, that we have been confronting for the last uh, 50 years or more. All right, thank you, excellent point. So to kind of summarize what you said, like don't leave our people behind, right? Get our prisoners out, don't forget about them. To um, be aware of the tactics that the government's using against us, to have a spiritual consciousness and a belief that we can win to act internationally and to act in coalition. And um, those are all excellent points. The um, website for Jericho, somebody put in the chat. So if people wanted to, to check that out, what you were talking about with the- Also they can go to, uh, they can go to the spiritofmandela.org. Okay. Spiritofmandela.org and learn about the International Tribunal 2021. Okay, great. So Maury, I'd like to, to ask you that same question, the lessons from COINTELPRO and how we can learn um, from that for what's going on now and what, what can we do as Jalil was saying? Okay, one of the first lessons for me is remembering something that uh, uh, Niccolo Machiavelli said in his celebrated work, The Prince, you know, this little book that is still studied, you know, meditate over, meditated over by politicians and wannabe uh, political figures all over the world, from leading universities all over the world, the prince. He said, uh, there are two ways of fighting. One is with arms and the other is with law. And so I think it's important for us to understand how law has always been used as a weapon of war. You know, when I look at COINTELPRO, you know, COINTELPRO never died. It, it went underground, but it never died. 
and it came back out with a vengeance, I mean, in a very muscular way after the tragedy of 9-11. You know, the USA Patriot Act and its affiliated tentacles are all COINTEL pro manipulations on steroids. That's what they are. And, and, and COINTEL pro is right in our face today. It's, it's not something that's being hidden, it's in our face. Um, what, what, what's essential for us to do is, is, is to, first of all, understand this, that COINTELPRO lives. Uh, and secondly, you know, the responsibility we have to engage in pushback. We have to engage in very muscular, uh, well-directed, well-organized, well-thought-out pushback on all fronts, on many, on many different fronts. And, and I should say, on, on the, to, to uh, you know, touch upon an optimistic note, I'm, frankly, I'm very encouraged by what I have seen, seen over the past year in the United States and globally. I'm very encouraged. I mean, after being disappointed by <laughs> successive generations <laughs> after the 60s, uh, you know, the, the way that we, we, we seem to, you know, the generations that followed uh, seem to have been pacified in, in many different ways. Um, now we're, we we're seeing an, another generation that is in, in one sense reminiscent of the 60s, but it's, it's even more impressive in the sense that it, it's, it's far more diverse and, and it's uh, the size of it is far more significant. Um, I mean, we see people who have gone have gone into the streets, folks. Who, who I, I I can't tell you the number of folks I heard, you know, in being interviewed, who are saying that they had uh, they were participating in a demonstration for the first time in their lives, you know, um, and. Uh, you know, so you had the young, you had the you know the, the middle, the, the, those in the middle, you had the 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 seniors, the elderly. You had you know so many people in the streets over the past year uh, with a new level of consciousness, you know, and uh, uh, and, and a uh, a determination to to bring about change and this is what encourages me and and all i would want to say is is to the young especially to the young folk out there you know keep on you know keeping on you got to maintain the struggle as you know the, the brother said you know this it's not it, it's not a sprint it is it is indeed a marathon you know we we have to maintain and we have to be focused and we cannot allow ourselves to be um, dis distracted and, and uh, you know, moved into areas that are going to be counterproductive to the overall effort for, for much needed, long overdue positive change. Uh, I'm encouraged, but, you know, we, we just, we've got to remain vigilant um, because, you know, folks who have been benefiting and systems the systems that have been in place that have been benefiting from this madness, you know, from the earliest days of this experiment in democracy, <laughs> they're not going to go down without a fight. They're not going to just throw in the towel and say, okay, you win. They're going to fight to the very end. And we have got to be, we have to meet their determination with determination. And, um, and, and we've got to be focused. Those of us who believe in spirituality, those of us who believe that there is a God and that there is a day of accountability, we, we must tap into that and, and utilize that to help us keep going and to keep us directed and, and, and uh, you know, to prevent us from being diverted into counterproductive habits and behaviors that, you know, um, uh, ended up defeating uh, the, 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 uh, the movement for for social and political change in the past, and 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 I'll I'll end on this because this is a very important note. Um, I, I mentioned how Imam Jamil is that bridge. He's a bridge that represents the '60s, 
uh, and, and the generations of uh, political prisoners, many of whom are dying off in prisons after decades upon decades. He represents them, that generation of struggle, and he also represents this new generation of political prisoners who are, who are disproportionately Muslim, disproportionately. He represents both. He is that bridge between both. And that's why one of the reasons why he is so significant, uh, uh, you know, beyond the fact that, you know, he has, we owe him. He has struggled and he has uh, paid a, a huge price for the struggles that he's engaged in. And we owe him, all of us do, you know, to do, to do a better job of, of advocating for him. But we, what we what must also be very conscious of is not allowing um our uh, movement for positive change to be compromised. Because at the end of the day, one of the lessons that we must learn is that one of the reasons why COINTELPRO was able to be as effective as it was during the 60s and, and the 50s, the 60s and 70s, why it was able to be so effective is because of some of the internal contradictions and deficiencies within and among you know, the... Um, uh, the agents within the movements, you know, there were contradictions, there were, there were deficiencies, there were weaknesses that COINTELPRO was able to exploit. So we've got to learn from that. We have to learn from that so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And, um, you know, we can hopefully successfully put this, this potentially great, <laughs> but deeply disturbed nation called America back on uh, we'll put it on for the, you know, the, the first time, really, uh, the, the kind of um, uh, freedom and, and, and liberating uh, rail that it, 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 it was supposed to have been on from the beginning, but uh, and it's come close, but, you know, it just hasn't been able to keep itself on that track. And, you know, hopefully we can we can help it now. If, if, if we can, then <laughs> after everything that we've been through over the past year and what, the, what, what this country is going through right now and what the globe is going through under the influence largely of this country, then if we can't do it now, then heaven help us all, as that old saying goes. All right. Thank you, Maury, for that. Um, Jaleel, I'd like to ask you um, your perspective on what's been going on with these all the people in the streets over the last year with the Black Lives Matter movement. I think I've heard you describe it as a consciousness movement before and all the people that are speaking out about racial justice and taking a variety of actions, some just performative, but it allows an environment where you can have a Hollywood movie called Judas and the Black Messiah made by black directors with, you know, and that I think it was a really good movie. I don't know if you got a chance to see it. Maybe you could give your opinion on that if you did. Um, either one of you or any of you, but um, also just kind of what you think about this movement over the last year or so, Jaleel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Uh, first of all, but I'm going to go to the movie first. Uh, the movie in itself was entertaining, right? The movie was not about a movie about uh, Fred Hampton. The movie was about the perspective and the viewpoint of an agent, of a provocateur. And it seemed to, to in some instances, uh, uh, serve to sanitize uh, this provocateur of this agent of, of, uh, of destruction, all right? And they end up resulting in, in, in uh, uh, Fred and, and uh, um, uh, Mark Clark's uh, death. And so in that instance, I, I don't think that it did the, the story justice uh, because you know, they came from the wrong lens in, in its approach uh, to the story. And, but what it did do, it opened the door for that kind of conversation, for this kind of dialogue, which is extremely important. Second of all, in regards to the issues of uh, Black Lives Matter and the matter for Black lives, uh, I think it's important for us to understand two things. One, why would that question have to even be asked, right? Because it then leads to the understanding that we got a problem in this country, uh, mm -hmm. that we have to even raise the question of, does Black lives really matter? Right? Does there a value to Black lives, right? And so even having to pose that kind of question raised the spectrum of the degree that white supremacy is uh, endemic in this country, how it is so entrenched and uh, institutionalized in this country that we even have to question our own moral and ethic foundation that ask the question, does Black Lives Matter? Okay, now, having done so, 
hadn't had the necessity to do so, we understand that it's not necessarily revolutionary, all right? Uh, what it does do is raise social consciousness, right? And uh, in the part that era, uh, we had Steve Biko, and he had the Black Consciousness Movement in, in, in South Africa. So I take that similarly to what's going on in this country, with the exception of we don't have revolutionary determination that in, in line, and lined up as, as did exist in South Africa during Steve Biko's yeah. Black Consciousness Movement. And so in this instance, I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done here in this country. Uh, this does open the door for the conversation, right? And to a degree that we can have to have to put it into proper parameters, how does Black Lives Matter? Now that we know that Black Lives does matter, then how does it matter, okay? And in that instance, uh, we have not yet defined uh, because of the corporate interests of, of the United States and white supremacy has continued to try to frame that story uh, and, and keep it within, this, within the confines of this ideology of control or the basis for control. And so in this instance, we still got some work to do in regards to defining what it means in regards to the, the, the value of black lives and how it, how it, how it has a, a possibility of contributing to the overall uh, evolution of, of the social order. And we're not, they're not really giving us that opportunity yet. They're not providing those resources yet. Uh, so that black people or people of color can have the, the, the capacity uh, to, uh, 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 to influence the processes of uh, the evolution of the so social order. Uh, but we have got the conscience, we got the, the conversation going, right? And now we need to really take it outside of the box of corporate entities who are, or, or even the nonprofits uh, who are basically in control of the narrative, right? We need to take it out of there, that, that, that box of narration and create our own box of narration of how uh, Black people and Black lives matter in this country. All right, thank you, Jaleel. Um, I think we're gonna wrap up pretty soon. We usually don't go past four and it's like four, it's like 10 after four. So we're gonna probably wrap up pretty soon. Um, I wanted to see if, if Maury or Steve had any comments about the movie. I thought it was good, but I hear your point. You know, it was, kind of a, a concept of comparing the two of them, but I hear your point about that. Um, I don't know if the other two of you got a chance to see it or not. If no, I haven't seen it myself. You haven't seen it more? I haven't seen it myself either. Okay, all right. I, I would just add one thing I, I wanted to say. Uh, sure. Several years after I got involved in the struggle, I went down to the Jericho offices and met with the Jericho folks down there uh, what a wonderful group of people they are. I mean, these are really outstanding people <laughs> and they have given their, their life to, to getting folks out of jail. Uh, and I had a, a wonderful conversation with them and I urge everybody who's listening to this to go on their website and learn about the prisoners who are there. Uh, this is really important that you know the stories of these people and become part of your story. Everybody should internalize these stories. But I also have to say that I left the office with a heavy heart because I suddenly realized that I was going to spend the rest of my life just like they were trying to get not only the, pre the COINTELPRO people out, but also the preemptive prosecution people out. Mm -hmm. um, this is not for the short winded. This is a long haul and we've got to work on it. But like Maury, I got to say, I'm optimistic. I think this year could be the year that we're going to start to see a lot of movement. And I'm, I'm really hopeful. Yeah, well, it's definitely a marathon and not a sprint, as <laughs> Julia and Maury said. Um, and we'll see how far we can get in whatever time we have. But uh, do either of the other two of you no, want to have I, any closing thoughts? I, I just want to, my, my final remark is to simply, again, salute the Coalition for Civil Freedoms for uh, hosting this webinar. I, I, I uh, really appreciate uh, us, us doing this and uh, it's a very important issue. And I um, encourage those who were able, able to catch this live uh, to share it widely. Uh, and um, hopefully we can, we can continue to build off of the energy uh, that, that, that comes out of this. Uh, this is uh, an ongoing struggle and it must be engaged uh, for ourselves and for the generations to come, the Idnillah. 
All right, Jaleel, any closing thoughts? And thank you so much for doing this with us. I hope we can. You know, I, 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 I would like to close. Uh, I would like, to, I'd like for uh, uh, Brother Maury to close, uh, close us out with a, with a prayer, inshallah. Okay, one of the, 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 mo the, the, the most appropriate uh, prayers from the Quran is the short uh, uh, verse from uh, 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 the Surah Asr. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wal Asr. Inna al insana lafi kusr. Illa ladina amanu wa amalu salihat wa tawasaw bil haq wa tawasaw bil sabr, which means in translation, in the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful. By the token of time through the ages, verily humanity is in loss, except those who believe and do good and exhort one another to truth and exhort one another to patiently persevere. All right. Thank Amen. you, everybody. Alhamdulillah. And um, this will be on Facebook and it will also be on our YouTube channel. It has been recorded. So um, it's been a wonderful conversation. And thanks to to all of our speakers and audience. All right. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Steve. And good, good connecting with you, Brother Jaleel. Alhamdulillah. May Allah My bless you, brother. We will we'll see each all. other in the passing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All right.